Hey, Red Pathers, this is Matt Hartman coming to you from Pittsburgh, PA. Special treat for today, we are going to be talking about chest pathology, and this is going to have some of the best rad path. This is based on a lecture by Dr. Carl Furman, one of my mentors from the University of Pittsburgh. A uh, fun story, uh, my dad, also a radiologist um, and a rad pather, taught Dr. Furman at the AFIP, and then Dr. Furman uh, taught me. And then I'm able to, to uh, reach all you guys on this medium, um, which is very exciting. But unfortunately, Dr. Furman uh, passed away, um, but his uh, legend uh, lives on. I'm hoping to do him um, share some Furmanisms with you guys and uh, share a lot of his teaching points with you. Uh, through this video, and um, a very nice uh, tribute is the science wing that was um, made in his honor at uh, Erie Prep, uh, where he's from. This is the first Furmanism. Why are the lungs too white on either a radiograph, CT, whatever? Something is in the lungs taking up space, getting absorbed, making them too white. And he drilled this into us as med students. Blood, water, cells, pus. And we'll use this. Um, a differential uh, throughout today. Use this when you're reading chest x-rays, but blood, water, cells, pus. So that's the first Furmanism. Again, the entire lecture can be found on the ACR building blocks site under the pathology section. And for those who like Anki flashcards, we have the Rad Path deck that's uh, for everyone's use. For instructions on how to access it, go to the About section on our YouTube channel. So let's get started. So again, this is Dr. Furman's lecture. I'm going to do my best um, to um, go through it with you, point out the rad path, and again, give you some of those Furmanisms. Um, so we'll start with lung adenocarcinoma. So the things I remember is that it is usually associated with smoking but it is the most common lung tumor in non-smokers, especially females, and it is located in the periphery. It can present as a solitary pulmonary nodule or a mass. We're gonna talk a lot about PET-CT today. PET-CT has revolutionized uh, radiology, especially um, I've seen in the past uh, 20 years as a resident and then uh, beyond, um, makes use of radioactive glucose, will localize in areas of high metabolism, including cancer. And we measure something called the standard uptake value. Anything over 2.5 is considered metabolically active. You're suspicious for tumor, but they realize there are also some non-cancerous etiologies that can light up as well, such as uh, infectious granulomas, um, abscesses, and things like brown fat. There's a whole uh, litany of things that can uh, give you a false um, a positive. Um, and realize you can also get false negatives. That means you have a cancer, but it is not lighting up. And adenocarcinoma, especially if there's the bronchialveolar features, is one of those that um, might be there on the regular CT, but is not lighting up on the uh, the PET CT. So that, that's a good pearl. So let's start out with a chest radiograph. We got the frontal and the lateral. This is a pre-op um, and a patient with long smoking history, and hopefully you can see the finding. Right lower lobe mass. This is a great example of the spine sign. The vertebrae should be getting darker as you go down, but here it's getting more opaque. There's something in there, blood, water, cells, pus. And it looks like there might be a cavity in there. And we'll talk about uh, cavitary lesions. Here we see very well on the CT, the cavitary part. We see the fissure, and we very nicely, we're seeing some emphysematous changes, especially in the upper lobes. Remember, this patient had a long history of smoking. Here it is on a different window. And we remember that cavitary lesions always think about um, squamous cell carcinoma, but realize adenocarcinoma can uh, cavitate as well. Here very nicely, the PET-CT, SUV of 19.6. Again, anything over 2.5 is very suspicious, especially here with a cavitary uh, component. This is cancer till proven otherwise. 
And here is our great rad path specimen from the right lower lobectomy. We'll see some emphysematous changes, especially in the upper lobes. This would be a great one to show the um, elementary school kids to tell them why not to smoke. And more come down view of the emphysema. So this lesion did have a cavitary component, which brings us to one of our first differentials for cavity. This is one of my favorite mnemonics because it actually has the word in it, cavity. So cancer, it's our first one. And like we said, it's usually squamous cell carcinoma, but as we saw in the other case, adeno can sometimes uh, cavitate as well. Abscess, vasculitides such as Wegner's, I for infection, I always think of TB, and septic emboli. T for trauma, and these are the patients that get the post-traumatic pneumatoceles, and then remembering why or youth. These are going to be congenital things, such as sequestrations. This would be a great thing for you guys to Google, look up at Radiopedia. There's two types of sequestrations, and um, that's some more advanced rad path, but I encourage you to look at that. So we are now going to start talking about the central lung tumors. That was a more peripheral adenocarcinoma, but our central lung tumors, I think of squamous cell carcinoma. Again, we're looking for cavitation and then small cell. So this is our next differential. So for squamous cell carcinomas, we said they often cavitate, very uh, high uh, correlation with smoking, and um, look for central mass with cavitation. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds here on this radiograph. Patient with hemoptysis, long smoking history, worried about pneumonia. And especially on the lateral, we see it's just too white there. Blood water cells pus, the level of the hilum. And the lateral radiographs are tough. Um, but I'm going to tell you, look at it, compare it with a normal here, and this is too white there. So we're worried about left hilar mass. We get the truth machine, the CT, and it confirms we're seeing a mass at the level of the left hilum. Central tumor. Patient gets a pneumonectomy. This is the first post-op chest x-ray. There's a chest tube going in. And this is the pathologic specimen. Again, showing the central ilar tumor, solid, solid. And this explains the symptoms of cough and hemoptysis. So just a great rad path specimen here. So let's switch gears and talk about small cell carcinoma. Again, we said squamous and small cell are the two ones that love to be central. So we're looking for a central tumor. This is neuroendocrine. When you look under the micro microscope, you, you know, they're going to use those neuroendocrine types of stains. Um, very easy for the pathologists um, to discern those. Um, uh, clinically, you know, it's going to be similar symptoms, cough, hemoptysis, um, long smoking history. Um, and we have a very interesting case coming up because I was I was always taught that if you have small cell, cats out of the bag, and they are often not going to resect these. It's going to just be chemotherapy and uh, hope for the best. And that's usually the case. Um, but we have this um, example: a 57 year old smoker with cough. Again, do the chest X-ray, and uh, what are we seeing? Well, again, that left hilar region is a little bit too white. It's confirmed on the truth machine with the uh, CT and then really confirmed on the PET CT. And they decided to uh, do surgery for this um, patient. Again, usually with small cell, it's going to be non-operative, but they thought it was localized um, and could get a good response and did the pneumonectomy and get a great gross specimen here. And we will show a more typical case 
of a small cell lung cancer. Again, similar thing, uh, symptoms, dyspnea, shortness of breath. Um, this was five months earlier, basically a normal radiograph, and fast forward five months, not normal. Again, too white in this area, blood, water, cells, pus. That's what we're thinking. And maybe it's a combination. Maybe it's a, a tumor with um, infection. And this is a fast growing tumor. Again, five months ago, basically normal on the radiograph. So this tells us this is going to be a very aggressive tumor. We also have a oral effusion. So this isn't going to be a non-surgical candidate. They will be treated with chemotherapy and or radiation. And initially will do very well. Um, basically can shrink even a large tumor like this initially, but um, and the chemotherapy just keeps getting better and better. Okay, we're going to switch gears now and talk about mediastinal masses, specifically those in the anterior mediastinum. And uh, we all learned from step one, the four T's, terrible lymphoma. Again, every Hartman differential, Metz lymphoma. So never forget lymphoma, thymoma, thyroid, and teratoma. Let's see what we got. We're going to start with the thymomas. And realize this could be any thymic. Um, when we had the T with a th thymus, it could be any uh, thymic uh, malignancy. Could, you know, thymoma is going to be the most common. There's thymic carcinoids, uh, th thymic carcinomas, a uh, whole, whole lot of other um, things that can go wrong with, with the thymus. But thymoma is the most common. We remember the association with myasthenia gravis. And um, these are often very um, uh, round, well marginated, um, encapsulated. Um, you can sometimes do some tricks with uh, MRI to evaluate for these. Uh, it's a little bit over our pay grade here for uh, for this rad path lecture, but just realize there's some additional things we can do uh, radio radiologically to make that diagnosis. The first thing though is to um, identify it and then identify it's in the mediastinum. So um, hopefully here on the frontal, we see an extra area that's a little bit too white. Blood water cells pus, trying to decide is this coming from the lung, the mediastinum, the pleura. The lateral helps us very anteriorly located, so we think it's from the um, anterior mediastinum. Confirmed on the CT, PET CT, just a little bit of a metabolic activity, so it tells us it's, um, um, you know, on, on the, the spectrum of being neoplastic. Um, so we're definitely worried about this. Thymoma, um, lymphoma are going to be very high in our differential. And ultimately, this will, you know, we could biopsy it and or surgically remove it. And this is just a real nice example of just how well marginated circumscribed this is. No capsular invasion and basically take it out. Uh, no recurrence. Let's switch gears now and talk about pleural pathologies, and we'll use mesothelioma as our um, example to demonstrate uh, pleural pathologies. Here in Western PA, we see lots of mesothelioma. We all remember the association with asbestos um, and um, puts you at risk for uh, mesotheliomas. Um, we will often see the pleural plaques, which is a marker of asbestos exposure. Um, the tumor itself does not develop in those pre-existing plants, and uh, up to 55, 50 percent of mesothelioma uh, cases will have no plaques. Surgery um, is very complicated. Most of the cases we're going to see are um, advanced, and um, surgery uh, will not be done for those. But this is a nice example of a uh, retired pipe fitter, asbestos exposure, uh, certainly asbestos risk, and we see very irregular oral thickening on the left. Again, the right side doesn't look too bad. I think that's why they, they did the resection here. It was isolated to the left side. Um, is has some FDG activity here, so we're definitely worried about um, neoplasm. And just a great bad path surgical specimen, just seeing this plural deposits, plural deposits all over. It's 
So let's talk about diffuse lung disease. And we saw a little bit of this in the first example with the smoker who had emphysema. And um, emphysema, the different subtypes, central lobular, panlobular, paraseptal. Um, things we're looking for on the X-ray or CT. The first thing is the volume. That's one of the first things I look for when we a chest radiograph is the volume. Um, normal, too low, too high. In case of emphysema, the lungs will be hyperinflated. You will have uh, increased lung volume. They might have a barrel chest, diaphragms pulled down. As in this 61 year old smoker. Decreased vascular markings. Um, you note the patient's actually getting oxygen here, so look for all your clues. Um, flat diaphragms, this is going to be a, a pretty severe case of emphysema. And we have the CT as well. The lungs are too, in this case, too black, uh, sort of the opposite of the um, too white a differential of blood water cells passed up. They're too black. We're thinking um, emphysema. And again, it usually involves the upper lobes more than the lower lobes. And here is the uh, CT really showing that well, worst disease in the upper lobes. Um, and this patient got a double lung transplant, so they had to take out the original lungs. And again, this is the um, type of case we want to show to the um, elementary school kids and tell them not that this is why you don't want to smoke. And again, this is a nice example of the pre transplant lungs too black and then post transplant. This might be subtle, but hopefully you can see too dark. And then this is sort of like Goldilocks, just perfect amount. Our next diffuse lung disease will be pulmonary fibrosis, IPF. As opposed to emphysema, which has increased lung volumes, this will have decreased lung volumes. You know, um, our pulmonologists doing the pulmonary function test will already know this, um, but this will be one of our clues on either X-ray or CT, looking at those lung volumes. And what we'll be looking for um, in the most advanced cases are this honeycomb pattern, the end stage lung, which is going to, in this example, with IPF, it will be worse in the lung bases. Emphysema is worse in the lung apices, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis will be worse in the lung bases. I had a, um, attending always said first and worst for pulmonary fibrosis at the lung bases, and we'll see some um, examples of that. Uh, again, look at the lung volumes first. If you're counting the number of ribs, not that many. This is the, the deepest breath this patient can take, and it's restricted by all this fibrosis. And this is probably one of the best examples I've seen of honeycombing. Again, this patient has the oxygen tubing overlying the, um, uh, the neck region. This patient needs um, oxygen to um, be breathing. Here it is on CT. I think we see even better the honeycombing. Again, it's first and worst at the lung bases. Another nice high resolution CT showing this honeycombing. And a great gross specimen here showing that fibrosis and honeycombing. This is end stage fibrosis. And this is another, uh, Dr. Furman was great at doing this, showing the before and after. So this is before the transplant, really bad. Lung fibrosis, low lung volumes, and this is two years after a double lung transplant. You can see the sternal wires, better lung volumes, much happier patient. 